good evening. You're watching the News at 6 with me, Sean Russell. The News at 6 is all about the day's biggest developing stories and we'll be filling in on them over the next half hour. But first, the headlines that we're tracking right now. India steps up diplomatic offensive against Pakistan, summons Pakistan's High Commissioner Abdul Basib to give him evidence of Pakistani involvement in the Uri terror attack. Prime Minister Narendra Modi calls high-level meeting after the Indus Water Treaty. The government wants to take a hard look at the MFN status to Pakistan. Supreme Court orders Karnataka to release 6,000 Qsecs of Kaveri water to Tamil Nadu for the next three days. Also asks the centre to bring both state chief ministers together for a meeting to end the impasse. And the World Trade Organization cuts forecasts for global trade drastically, warns that a projected 1.7% growth has hit its slowest pace since the global financial crisis. Our top story this evening, in a fresh move to exert pressure on Pakistan, India may withdraw the most favoured nation status given to the neighbour. Though to put this into effect, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called a meeting of top government officials on Thursday. If India revokes the MFN status given to Pakistan, it will mean diminished imports from that country. Tightening the screws on Pakistan. A day after he reviewed the Indus Water S Treaty, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called for another high-level meeting on Thursday. This time, to take a good hard look at the most favoured nation status granted to Pakistan. The high-level meeting will have top officials of the PMO, the MEA and the Commerce Ministry. India gave Pakistan the most favoured nation status in 1996. Pakistan did agree to reciprocate at a secretary-level agreement in 2012. But so far, it has not kept its promise. Although experts say that even if India withdraws the status, the impact will be mainly symbolic. Since bilateral trade between the neighbours represents only a fraction of India's overall goods trade. If we scrap the MFN, uh, which is part of our obligation under the WTO, um, it will uh, affect Pakistani exports to India, because uh, and uh, because um, then India would be able to apply higher tariffs uh, than the, than uh, what we do for other countries. Because MFN simply means that uh, we give the same tariff uh, treatment to all countries. India has never reviewed any of these arrangements with Pakistan because India has always thought Pakistan a brother or a friend and in order to increase the relationships among the uh, SARC countries they gave the unilaterally the MFN treatment to Pakistan. They also gave a very liberal agreement to Pakistan on the world under the World Bank auspices for Indus Water Treaty. And that was a long time ago in 1960. Immediately there was war in 65. There was war in 71. And generally under the law of treaties, the rule is that once the war takes place and all the treaties are defunct. After that, you know, everything has to be reviewed. We have never done that. So it is really a unilateral gesture which has been going on on the part of India. So we have for the first time, we feel that it should be uh, necessary to review all these arrangements and see what will be in the interest of India, what will be the interest of the region and what will be India's obligations to the international community. Opposition parties however say withdrawing the MFN status might not be enough. The Congress is calling for imposition of economic sanctions as well on Pakistan. We've heard a lot of uh, speeches, rhetorics, meetings, visual of meetings and unofficial press briefings. What is the concrete action being taken against Prime Minister is what India wants to understand and know from the Prime Minister. We had pointed out on day one, three actions needs to be taken. Isolate Pakistan diplomatically, ensure economic sanctions come from countries which are, uh, are financing Pakistan. Thirdly, ensure that there is a decisive, specific, precise, and a proper and a fitting strategic response. Modi government has failed to do all three. The MFN status allows Pakistan give equal treatment in terms of trading prices or tariffs 
and market access without discrimination in imports and exports. But out of India's total merchandise trade of $641 billion in 2015-16, Pakistan accounted for a mere $2.67 billion. India's exports to the neighbouring country worked out to $2.17 billion or 0.83% of the total Indian outward shipments while imports were less than $500 million or just 0.13% of the total inward shipments. Withdrawal of MFN status from Pakistan is not more than notional because Pakistan has little to sell to India. But it will be interesting to see how Prime Minister Narendra Modi assesses the situation if Pakistan retaliates by putting an embargo on Indian goods. Akhile Suman for Raj Sabha Television in Delhi. And stepping up its diplomatic offensive against Pakistan, India today summoned Pakistan High Commissioner Abdul Basit and gave him evidence of the cross-border origins of the Uri terror attack. In a Twitter message, MEA spokesperson Vikas Swaroop said Foreign Secretary S. Jai Shankar summoned Basit and told him that the two guides who helped infiltration were apprehended by local villagers and are now in police custody. Saroop disclosed that one of the slain Uri attackers has been identified as Hafiz Ahmad, son of Feroz and a resident of Darbagh, Muzaffarabad in Pakistan. Mohammad Kabir Rawan and Basharat have been identified as the two handlers of the Uri attack. This is the second time that India summoned the Pakistani envoy over the Uri terror attack. And for more on this, let's go across to our correspondent, Akhilesh Suman, who's been tracking the story. Akhilesh, a few days ago, Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif had said that India is making the allegation that uh, the Uri terror attack was originating in Pakistan without any evidence. Now that the evidence is there, India trying to diplomatically isolate Pakistan even more. Yeah, naturally, naturally, Pakistan Prime Minister never accepts at this point of time. Though in, after Pathan Kod's incident, they have asked for some proof that... Uh, uh, if they want uh, uh, to, to be investigated jointly. This time also, uh, Pakistan is asking that there should be an investigation, but they are asking more than just bilateral, they are asking international neutral investigation. So Pakistan is also trying to put India under pressure uh, in a way that uh, India is telling something that, is not, that cannot be substantiated. But now, Foreign Secretary S. Jasankar has called Abdul Basit today and he has given that two, uh, the handlers who were sitting in Pakistan and two guides who are hailing from Mujaffarabad, they are substantial addresses. Uh, so, and so it is now, ball is in the court of Pakistan, how it plays. But it is interesting that India is trying to downgrade the relationship with Pakistan on every front. Uh, uh, from the beginning, it, that it is uh, sponsoring terrorism, it is telling that isolate Pakistan. It is telling that put some type of sanction against Pakistan. And when you see that MFN status review, it is in a way part of the appeal for sanctioning. Because if you go and talk to any country that please sanction Pakistan, they will ask you how you are giving MFN status and how you are telling me to sanction Pakistan. So in India is trying to create a level playing ground and a case against Pakistan that see we are trying to isolate Pakistan on terrorism and you people should also come on board and India is trying to do in the same way because after two wars, India did not uh, right. break away from the Indus Valley, Indus Water Treaty and now India is trying to review it. India did not uh, go against MFM status and now India is trying to review it. So it is a message that since you are running a proxy war against India, we are going to consider every relationship with you. That's the whole message. All right, so the India uh, playing hardball with Pakistan, uh, but as far as uh, support from the international community is concerned, while well, there has often been a lot of lip service in terms of uh, saying that uh, the Uri terror attack was horrible, other nations have not really fallen in line. So in terms of our diplomatic offensive, getting other countries involved uh, to put sanctions to uh, go against Pakistan, how is that progressing? And would the evidence, presentation of the evidence help in that? Yeah, naturally, we keep asking these type of questions with uh, external affairs ministry officials and they tell that, see, it cannot be done in a day. Because remember, Pakistan relationship with America was as robust as any other two countries could have. They had been uh, non-NATO ally of uh, America. So you cannot tell that in just a way, in just one incident or other, uh, America is going to come on board with you uh, as far as sanctioning is concerned. And Chinese are taking um, Pakistani as a very good uh, ally and very good uh, 
pathway uh, to go into the deep sea uh, um, just besides Iran. So in a way, it's a very big interest involved of the big powers. And India has to go extra mile to prove, to persuade, give them market access, all diplomatic things India has to play before uh, they are ready to, uh, for going to sanction against Pakistan. Because remember that Pakistan has a structural uh, stability in its country, even though army is very strong. But they have democratic structure. They have uh, government, running government. So you cannot just tell that Pakistan is a uh, non-state. Non Pakistan is a state. Pakistan is a nation. Right. So India has to make its case very hard. And I think that this is trying. Uh, this is the case of becoming uh, to make it stronger and stronger so that India can persuade. But messaging is quite clear that yes, we are taking hard steps against Pakistan. And if you want to uh, put a check on terrorist sanctuary, you people should come on board. This is the type of messaging. All right, Akhilesh, we leave it over there. Akhilesh will, of course, keep a track of the story for us. Thanks so much for joining us for now. Now, the war of words between India and Pakistan continued at the United Nations a day after External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj asserted in her address to the General Assembly that Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India. Pakistan's permanent representative to the UN, Malia Lodi, today exercised the right of reply uh, to Swaraj's address, claiming that her remarks were a litany of falsehoods about Pakistan. Lodi also insisted in calling Kashmir a disputed territory, delivering a scathing response. Our first secretary in the Indian mission to the UN, Inam Gambhir, said that India entirely rejected Lodi's sermons. Quoting from the address of the External Affairs Minister, Gambhir said, Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India and will always remain so. She further called Lodi's remarks the views of a dysfunctional state that built atrocity upon atro atrocity on its people while it preaches the values of tolerance and democracy and human rights. We have heard today the distinguished permanent representative of Pakistan make a fanciful and misleading presentation on the situation in the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. At the same time, we did not see any attempt by her to answer questions that are being posed repeatedly by the international community to Pakistan. Can the representative of Pakistan clarify how is it that terror sanctuaries and safe heavens in her country continue to flourish despite the Pakistan Army's much wanted counterterrorism operations and the billions of dollars of international counterterrorism aid it obtains? Can the representative of Pakistan confirm that they do not use terrorist proxies and export terrorism as a matter of state policy? Can the representative of Pakistan deny that Pakistan has assured in 2004 that it would not allow its territories or territories under its control to be used for terror attacks against India? Reacting to India's review of the Indus Water Treaty, Pakistan has warned it will approach the United Nations and the International Court of Justice on the matter. Pakistan Foreign uh, Policy Chief Sartaj Aziz said on Tuesday that any violation of the 56-year-old treaty will be tantamount to an act of war. Addressing the National Assembly, Aziz said, as per the international law, India unilaterally cannot separate itself from the treaty, adding that there is no provision in the pact for suspension or unilateral exit. His remarks come a day after Prime Minister Narendra Modi chaired a meeting in New Delhi, reviewing the pros and cons of the treaty and the options available before India to repeal the treaty with Pakistan. Now, India and China on Tuesday held talks on enhancing cooperation on counterterrorism as officials from both countries met in their first high-level dialogue in Beijing. The meeting comes 10 days after a terror attack at an army base in Jammu and Kashmir's Uri district in which 18 Indian soldiers were killed. The meeting was co-chaired by R.N. Ravi, chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, and Wang Yongxing, uh, uh, secretary general of the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission of China. The two sides exchanged views on the international and regional security situation. They also shared information on respective policies, systems and legislation to deal with terrorism, further enhancing their own understanding on issues of major concerns to both sides. The Supreme Court today asked Karnataka to release 6,000 cusecks of Kaveri water to Tamil Nadu in three days, overwriting Karnataka's argument that it does not have enough water to share. Seeking an amicable settlement of the matter, Congress MPs are now demanding Prime Minister Modi intervene in the matter. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court sternly ordered Karnataka to release 6,000 cusecks of Kaveri water to neighbouring Tamil Nadu for the next three days. 
also giving a tight deadline, the Apex Court asked the centre to bring both chief ministers together for a meeting over Kaveri impasse by Friday. There will be some implication because now the Karnataka government, has, uh, the legislature has taken a decision, unanimous decision, not to release any water since there is no water to release. That is one thing. And now the Supreme Court has directed, in spite of such resolution, the government has to release 6,000 quick of water for two days. So that definitely it leads to confrontation uh, between uh, legislature and judiciary. Supreme Court has uh, uh, condemned the Karnataka government. The verdict of the uh, Supreme Court should be respected. That is the uh, message which we were also requesting. Karnataka continues to argue that it cannot release the 6,000 cusacks of water daily for a week or even for three days. The government claims that its cities are in danger of running out of drinking water by promising to spare water for Tamil Nadu only in December. However, considering Karnataka's petition, the court said it will hear their argument again on September 28th. But till then, it has to release water immediately. We appeal to the Supreme Court again saying that it is not possible to comply with the uh, order of the Supreme Court uh, as there is no sufficient water. This is a situation where the people of Karnataka are in huge distress. So that, that is why we, we have gone ahead with this modified petition requesting them to modify their order, looking at the ground realities. And also we are requesting, we are saying that we will not, it's not that we are saying we will not release the water. We will, but give us an extension by the end of the season uh, because anyway there may be some more rains. Uh, uh, as, as, uh, as and when the rains come, by the end of the season, by December, we will release the required quota of water. Escalating the matter, Congress MPs from Karnataka sought Prime Minister Narendra Modi's intervention in the Kaveri issue, urging him to convene a meeting of chief ministers of two states for an amicable settlement. Prime Minister of India, step in kare or dono ke uh, beech mein ek, uh, facilitate, a meeting facilitate kare. But isko to BJP logo ne support nahi kiya. The division of the Kaveri water that originates in Karnataka but flows into Tamil Nadu has locked both states in a conflict for several decades. But the latest agitation began on September 5th when the Supreme Court agreed that Tamil Nadu should get more water than it had been receiving so far to help its farmers. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Some more national news updates now and nationwide. The Urissa Assembly today witnessed pandemonium by opposition Congress and DGP members. They were demanding clarification from Chief Minister Naveen Patnaik on the sensitive Mahanadi River water dispute with neighbouring Chhattisgarh. The House was adjourned till afternoon as the opposition started slogans within the bell. Pak Patnaik in his reply on Saturday had said that the government was taking both administrative and legal action in the matter. The Income Tax Department issued summons to Delhi Health Minister Satyendra Jain in connection with its tax evasion probe against a Kolkata-based firm. Jain has been asked to appear before the department on the 4th of October and pers furnish personal financial details and ITRs for the last four years during his appearance. The minister in his reply said he had done nothing wrong. Former Corporate Affairs Director General B.K. Bansal uh, committed suicide in his Delhi apartment today. His son was also found dead. Bansal was arrested by the CBI in July for allegedly taking a bribe of 9 lakh rupees. Feeling humiliated, his wife and daughter committed suicide soon after the arrest. Taking note of this, Bansal was granted bail in August by a special CBI court. The police are probing the suicide case of the father and the son. The Supreme Court today asked the CBI to serve notice to UP Minister Azam Khan expressing its displeasure that he hasn't appeared before it in the Buran Shair gang rape case. The court issued notice to him calling the rape case a political conspiracy. It said Azam Khan should have deputed an advocate on his behalf. The court found it surprising that the UP government does not represent the minister. Time for us to take a short break. Lots more on the other side. Do stay tuned. The sacred relics of Buddha were unearthed in Piprava in Uttar Pradesh. Buddha. Buddhist monks from all over the world visit the National Museum to pay their respects. These charred bone fragments of Buddha are housed in the gold canopy gifted by the royal family of Thailand.
Welcome back. You're watching the News at 6. Now, Vice President Mohamed Hamid Ansari is in Nigeria as part of his five-day two-nation tour. The visit is aimed at strengthening India's bilateral engagements with uh, two West African nations of Nigeria and Mali. The visit is also likely to garner support for India's push for a global convention against terrorism at the United Nations. Vice President Mohammed Hamid Ansari on Monday arrived in Nigerian capital on the first leg of his five-day tour. He was received at the Abuja International Airport by his Nigerian counterpart, Yemio Sinbajo. During the first day of his five-day tour, the Vice President inaugurated the High Commission of India Chancery Complex and interacted with the members of the Indian community. There is a convergence of thinking on global matters, which in the world of tomorrow is going to be extremely important. Both of us play an important role on the Gulf, on the world stage. We contribute to the maintenance of peace in different parts of the world. Earlier, while addressing the media on board Air India special flight, Vice President mentioned that India had a long association with the African continent, starting from the days of decolonization, and that there is a natural sympathy and friendship which India receives in African nations. Now, speaking on India's ties with Nigeria, the Vice President said that the country was the largest in Africa in terms of population and that it carried significant weight in the region and internationally. Its own objectives for the reform of the United Nations were not dissimilar to India's goals. As and when UN reforms take place, Nigeria will occupy an important place. It has the same kind of expectations from UN as we have. Focusing on the issue of terrorism, the Vice President said that it had become a global menace, one that was disturbing social peace and impacting development. As far as counter-terrorism is concerned, the most important thing is exchange of information because terrorist networks are becoming global networks. Therefore, we must have a system and that system has now been put in place with most countries. Later today, the Vice President will hold talks with Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari, Vice President Osen Bajo, President of the Senate, Speaker of the House of Representatives and deliver an address at the National Defence College of Nigeria. He will also meet the Governor of Lagos and deliver an address at the Joint Business Forum at the University of Lagos. This is Amrita Rai and Anu Devan's report for Rajya Sabha TV. The World Trade Organization has cut its forecast for global trade growth this year by more than a third, warning that growth had hit its slowest pace since the global financial crisis. The low new figure of 1.7 uh, is down from the previous estimate of 2.8% in April. The UN agency also revised its 2017 forecast with trade now expected to grow between 1.8 to 3.1%, down from the previously anticipated 3.6%. The downturn reflects a slowdown in countries such as China and Brazil and lower levels of imports into the United States. WTO D Director General Roberto Azevedo warned that dramatic slowing of trade growth should serve as a wake-up call. He also voiced particular concern of the slowdown in the context of growing anti-globalization sentiment. The Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton and her Republican counterpart Donald Trump sparred over economy, jobs, tax cuts and foreign policy in their first face-off in a nationally televised presidential debate. The attacks also turned personal. Trump claimed Clinton did not have the right temperament to be president, while Clinton said that Trump had till date refused to release his tax returns. For the first time ahead of the November election, the two US presidential candidates clashed in a bitter television debate on Tuesday. Both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton went head-to-head -head on the issues of race, economy and foreign policy. Even personal attacks were not spared. Trump accused Clinton of not having the right temperament to be president. I also have a much better temperament than she has. You know, I have a much better. She spent, let me tell you, she spent hundreds of millions of dollars on an advertising, you know, they get Madison Avenue into a room, they put names, oh, temperament, let's go after. I think my strongest asset, maybe by far, is my temperament. I have a winning temperament. I know how to win. 
She does not have Secretary how to win. Clinton. Wait. The AFL CIO the other day, <clears throat> behind the blue screen, I don't know who you were talking to, Secretary Clinton, but you were totally out of control. I said, there's a person with a temperament that's got a problem. At the end of this evening, I'm going to be Clinton, in turn, accused a Republican rival of racism, Why sexism, yeah. and tax Why avoidance. He tried to switch from, from looks to stamina. But this is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. And someone who has said pregnancy is an inconvenience to employers, who has said, said women don't deserve equal pay unless they do as good a job as Didn't men. And one of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He loves beauty contests, supporting them and hanging around them. And he called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. The first female U.S. presidential candidate also lashed out at Trump's positions on foreign policy. She said they fell considerably short of standards expected from a presidential aspirant. She claimed Trump was too easily provoked and could be quickly drawn into a war involving nuclear weapons. It's also important that we look at the entire global situation. There's no doubt that we have other problems with Iran, but personally I'd rather deal with the other problems having put that lid on their nuclear program than still to be facing that. And Donald never tells you what he would do. Would he have started a war? Would he have bombed Iran? If he's going to criticize a deal that has been very successful in giving us access to Iranian facilities that we never had before, then he should tell us what his alternative would be. But it's like his plan to defeat ISIS. He says it's a secret plan, but the only secret is that he has no plan. In a rebuttal, the business tycoon repeatedly cast his opponent as a typical politician. Trump said Clinton should be held accountable for her time in the office. Mr. Secretary Clinton, when she started talking about this, it was really very recently. She's been doing this for 30 years. And why hasn't she made the agreements better? The NAFTA agreement is defective just because of the tax and many other reasons, but just because of the fact. Let me interrupt just a moment. But Secretary Clinton and others, politicians, should have been doing this for years, not right now because of the fact that we've created a movement. They should have been doing this for years. What's happened to our jobs and our country and our economy generally is, look, we owe $20 trillion. Both candidates also had a heated exchange on the state of economy, tax plans, and whether President Barack Obama was born in the U.S. But both pledged to wholeheartedly accept the outcome of the election. Recent opinion polls showed both candidates locked in a tight contest. With just over a month remaining for the election, the debates are expected to strongly influence the outcome. Two more debates are to follow on 9th and 19th October. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, that's it from us. Goodbye.